We're just over a day away from the launch of a deep space project decades in the making. After running over time and over budget, the James Webb Telescope will begin its journey tomorrow night. It will serve as the leading observatory over the next decade, taking over the helm from the renowned Hubble Telescope. It's been a long wait for scientists who are banking on their multi-million dollar investment to make breakthrough discoveries. We've done uh, two decades of innovation and hard work, and this is the result. Um, we are opening up a whole new territory of astronomy. We will see things that we've never been able to see before because this telescope is much more powerful than even the great Hubble telescope. So, where is the James Webb Telescope heading? It will take off on board an Ariane 5 rocket from French Ghana, starting a month-long trip to its point of orbit around the Sun. It will operate between the Sun and the Earth at a place known as Lagrance Point 2. From there, the telescope will avoid the shadows of both the Earth and the Moon, meaning unlike Hubble, it will always have an unimpeded view. I like to think of it as NASA's vehicle for the deepest space exploration that humanity can do. It will allow us to see farther back in time to the time when the very first stars and galaxies were being born. From Lagrange Point 2, James Webb is expected to make important observation using unprecedented technology. It brings with it a mirror made of 18 segments that will unfold after launch and a tennis court sized sun shield to protect its instruments. With the help of cameras and spectrometers, the telescope will gather information on the universe's early stages and observe exoplanets that might support life. We know that planets of all sizes are out there and we want to find ones that have similar temperatures and sizes as Earth to see if they could possibly be anything like Earth. While many exciting observations await, the telescope is not expected to be up and running until all its checkups and calibrations are complete about six months after launch. We've built a world-class infrared telescope. We've built it, we've aligned it, We've tested it, we've proved it worked. Now we're going to have to break it up, fold it up, and actually rebuild it on orbit, rebuild it, realign it, retune it, and get it to work robotically on orbit. That's for never more, been done before. For more on this, we're now joined by Peter Tartill from the University of Sydney's Institute for Astronomy. Professor Tartill is the only Australian scientist to have laid direct instrument design work on the project and joins us now. Welcome to the program. Good afternoon. You must be feeling pretty excited right about now. Yeah, and, and not a little bit scared as well. Uh, this, is, uh, this is six months of terror while we wait to, uh, for the, the telescope to pass all these hurdles as it journeys out to its final uh, cold, quiet orbit where we can get this wonderful view. And right now you must be really closely watching the weather systems. What are, the, what are you thinking there? Oh, well, the latest news I have from French Guiana is that uh, there was a weather system that came in. Uh, launch was scheduled for tonight, Australian time, I believe. Uh, and now, unfortunately, they've had to bump it. I, I think it might be tomorrow, but um, I'm, I'm just watching the same news feeds that you guys have. So uh, we're all just on the edges of our seats. I bet. Talk us through the technology that's involved here. Well, I mean, you can see on the screen right now, there's this lovely big mirror. Um, it's actually already about six, a bit more than six times larger than Hubble. And of course, big is better. And that's a, a nice sort of uh, extra collecting area for the, for the faint signals we're looking for. But that really doesn't, uh, doesn't describe the leap we're going to get with the James Webb adequately well, because in addition to that uh, larger mirror that we can, we can see there, um, we also have an entire telescope, and not only the telescope, but the orbit it's in, everything about it is optimised for this infrared band in the spectrum that they spoke about earlier. So that's heat radiation. Um, and the trick there, and the, the real secret source, I think, that, that James Webb brings, is that when you want to see these cold, far distant reaches of the cosmos and these subtle phenomena that are going on out there, um, it's a bit like trying to see a dark, uh, you know, your backyard at night from the brightly lit kitchen, first thing you're going to do is to walk up and turn all the lights off so you can see out through the window. So in essence, that's what James Webb is doing here. It's coasting out to this very cold, very calm, very quiet site out behind the moon where it's in perpetual shadow. 
And that enables it to work in this infrared band with spectacularly more efficiency than any other telescope before it. I suspect the scope of what you're trying to find out could be unlimited. But initially, what are you going to be looking for? Well, um, my particular little niche on this, I, I've built uh, a small part of the NEARUS instrument, one of the operational modes of NEARUS. So the telescope itself has four main science cameras that take the light from that lovely big mirror. And I'm part of one of those four instruments. Um, the piece that I'm going to be particularly looking for is to try and make the very finest detail in the images that we possibly can because, uh, you know, these objects that we're trying to study out in the cosmos are, are, are really titanically far away. And we need, you know, a really powerful zoom lens to bring the science, to bring the ac action back here to Earth. So, um, yeah, I'm going to be looking for the way in which this telescope can advance our understanding of planetary assembly, like uh, the NASA Goddard uh, interviewer was talking about, you know, we want to know how our own planet got here and what the conditions might be for hosting a little wonderful biosphere like the Earth. Might that happen very often out in the cosmos? And what do you think might be some of the practical applications of that knowledge, that intel? Well, I mean, it's, it's always a question we get asked for blue sky science, you know, what, what can I do with it uh, back here on Earth? Um, in fact, you never know. Uh, it's always very difficult to predict the the time scale between the kinds of technological advances we're seeing here on the screen, with the kind of things that it'll take to make this mission work, it's just amazing. We're launching this huge mirror. It's got to deploy all by itself. Uh, it's got to align itself perfectly. And there's no chance for an astronaut to go and visit it, uh, to maybe you know swap some pieces out if they break or to give a little kick in the hubcaps. So all of these technologies that we see uh, here for space, they do come back to Earth. It's just that often they take 30, 40 years, 50 years sometimes before that turnaround. But the blue sky science, this kind of fundamental research that you're, um, that you're advancing when you invest in these kind of telescopes, it, it pays off actually more than near market research in, in a long term.